Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep and welcome to our weekly explained session. Last week, unprecedented protests spread across China. These were mass protests. It was witnessed across multiple cities and it was led by a large group of people, particularly students at several prestigious universities and as well as across Chinese cities. Now, I'm using the word unprecedented because it is quite rare to witness such organic mass protests in an authoritarian state such as communist China. So this is what makes the development very, very important. So last week, China was in the news for all the wrong reasons. That's the reason why we have chosen this important topic for our explained session, the protests that were witnessed in China. So in this session, we're going to understand the reasons behind these protests that were witnessed in China. We'll talk about the history of protests in communist China. We'll carry out a detailed study of the polity and society of China as well, as this understanding is very relevant from India's perspective. As India's largest neighbor, China is very crucial for Indian interests. Don't forget, we share a disputed border with China, and China has repeatedly been hostile and aggressive against India. India also has a lot of economic dependency on China. So in this context, understanding China becomes very important, and thereby the topic is relevant for our exams as well. So we shall talk about the reasons behind this protest, how China is dealing with it. We'll examine the history of protests in communist China. We'll talk about the significance of these developments, not just for China's internal society and its polity, but also its impact on India and the rest of the world. So do support this initiative by liking the video, share your comments once the stream ends, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. So let's start with the discussion of today's explained topic. And first, let's understand the context. Over the last few days, mass organic protests were witnessed across China. These protests, they kicked off in the westernmost province of China, that is the Xinjiang region. And it quickly spread to many other parts of China, including prominent cities, such as Beijing, Shanghai, and others. At several prestigious universities, students organized themselves in large numbers and protested by displaying blank sheets of paper. This has become a symbolic form of protest, especially in China and also in several other authoritarian countries. In countries where raising slogans against the state and the government is banned by law, protesters often display a blank sheet so that they can convey the message without actually highlighting what they are trying to say. This is a way of evading the laws in such authoritarian states. When protests happened in Hong Kong as well, a couple of years ago, such blank sheet protests were carried out. This has become a symbolic way of protesting in authoritarian states. These unprecedented protests which were witnessed across China, they were primarily triggered by the popular resentment against the way in which the Chinese state has handled the pandemic. It's already been almost three years since the pandemic broke out and yet, China has implemented its strict zero COVID policy, which provides for very stringent lockdowns. Even after three years, whenever there is a small outbreak of cases, China imposes very strict lockdowns lasting for several weeks and months, carries out mass testing, forced quarantines, and this has restricted the freedom of people. It's not that people enjoyed a lot of freedom in China, which is an authoritative state, but still these curbs and restrictions was hampering the day-to-day -day life of people. It has disrupted the Chinese economy. It has affected the standard of living of the people and has taken an emotional mental toll as well on the health of the people. So popular resentment had been building up in China over several months against the strict zero COVID policy. China has not allowed the virus to spread and it has not allowed natural immunity to build up like other countries. Many other countries, after imposing lockdowns for a few months in 2020, they went for more calculated lockdowns in order to minimize the economic and social impact. But China, which has tried to protect the image of the party, that is the Chinese Communist Party or the Communist Party of China, it has adopted a very stringent policy called the Zero COVID policy, which aims to keep COVID cases at zero. Despite all these strict measures, the Omicron variant, which affected rest of the world several months ago, 
has now started spreading across China, resulting in a rapid surge of cases. More than 40,000 daily cases are being reported in China, and this has led China to enforce even stricter lockdowns and restrictions. So this has built up the resentment, and people have taken to the streets to protest against this policy as it is affecting their lives and their future itself. The primary trigger, or the immediate trigger for this protest, started in China's problematic region, that is the Xinjiang province, which you can see here in the map, the westernmost province of China. In Xinjiang, you have a important city called Urumqi located over here, and in Xinjiang, you have a minority community called the Uyghurs. The Uyghur Muslims, who are linked closely with Central Asia and Afghanistan, Pakistan, they form an ethnic linguistic minority in Xinjiang. The Uyghurs have long alleged that the Chinese state, the PRC, the People's Republic of China, which is ruled by the Communist Party of China, they have alleged that the Chinese state has oppressed them, targeted them, violated their human rights. So the Uyghurs in general have resisted the Chinese state and the Chinese rule, and some of them who have been radicalized have even taken up terrorism and established a terror outfit called ETIM, the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, which wages a war against the Chinese state, that is in the Xinjiang province. So in this sensitive province, at Urumqi, there was a fire accident that happened last week in a high-rise apartment complex. Last week, there was a major fire accident, which happened in an apartment complex in Urumqi, and 10 people were killed in this accident. This was the immediate trigger for these protests. Why? Because on social media, on Chinese social media, it started spreading that because of the lockdown restrictions, because of the zero COVID policy, people who were trapped in the building could not escape. The rescuers, the firefighters, emergency workers couldn't reach the building and the victims on time because of the strict lockdown restrictions. Now, please note, Xinjiang has been placed under lockdown for more than 100 days. It's already been more than three months where the entire Xinjiang province has been placed under a very strict lockdown. So the resentment and frustration had already built up over the last few months. And this incident which happened, this fire accident, which led to the death of 10 people, all of whom were Uyghurs, it immediately triggered protests in Urumqi and in Xinjiang. These protests, they were covered on social media, despite the best efforts of Chinese censors to cut off this news report. The news spread across Chinese social media and very quickly in other parts of China as well, protests took off as people were frustrated and angry that 10 people had died as a direct result of lockdown restrictions. See, the rest of China is dominated by the ethnic group known as the Hans. The Hans are the majority dominant ethnic linguistic group in China, whereas the Uyghurs are minorities. Initially, Chinese state was dismissing these protests in Xinjiang as motivated because Uyghurs have long been fighting against Chinese oppression. But now that the protests spread across China, even majority hands across major cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Wuhan and other places, they organically organized themselves, came out to the streets and protested against the zero COVID policy. Even prestigious universities saw major protests where students came out and shouted slogans calling for Xi Jinping to step down and calling for the end of the communist rule and calling for freedom to China. Now, this is quite unprecedented given that China is an authoritarian state. So it's in this context that these developments become very, very important. We should, of course, understand why China has continued with this strict zero COVID policy. What is China's argument here? We should talk about the history of protests in China and how China has dealt with protests in the past. Based on that understanding, we can talk about the implications for India and the rest of the world. See, the Chinese state, the PRC, the People's Republic of China, it's a one-party state. You just have one party, the Communist Party of China, headed by Xi Jinping, the General Secretary, who is also the President of the PRC. So the party itself forms the state in China. There are no elections, no democracy, and of course, no basic rights, no fundamental rights. 
So China being an authoritative communist state, basic fundamental rights such as freedom of press, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of association, the freedom to protest, these basic rights are curbed in an authoritarian communist state. Despite this, people have taken the risk of protesting against the communist party and against the PRC. That is one reason why this is such a significant development. The Chinese state has been saying that a zero COVID policy is needed to protect lives, to prevent the virus from spreading uncontrollably, which could overwhelm the healthcare system. This argument was valid maybe three years ago when the pandemic initially broke out. Initially, most countries went with a strict lockdown to prepare their healthcare systems. But very quickly, they realized that lockdowns can have many side effects. It can have devastating economic and social consequences. So slowly around the world, lockdown restrictions were relaxed and lockdowns were used as a strategic tool to contain the virulent spread of the pandemic only when it was absolutely necessary. Otherwise, most countries allowed the virus to spread, building natural immunity and balancing both sides, both objectives, which was to save lives at the same time protect the economy and the society. But China has insisted that saving lives is more important. At any cost, the virus cannot be allowed to spread. Now, why would China do this? China knows the economic cost. It knows the social cost of this. Despite being aware of the consequences, China has adopted the strict zero COVID policy primarily to protect the image of the Communist Party and its leadership. Authoritarian governments are very, very concerned about their image. The image that people hold within the country and also the global image. See, China has definitely managed to keep the death toll at a lower rate compared to other big countries. China has definitely limited the spread of the infection through these strict measures. But here the true intention is not just to save lives, but the true intention here is to protect the image of the leader, the top leadership of the Communist Party, the Standing Politburo, and to retain the image of the PRC itself. So people of China definitely see through this, and that is the one reason why they have expressed their resentment against the policy which is affecting their day-to-day -day lives. So as a result, public frustration has accumulated over the last few years, and especially in the last few months, protests have been happening here and there. Small-scale protests have happened in the past months as well. But the incident which happened in Xinjiang, the fire accident, became the trigger for widespread protests which spread across the country and it has rattled the Chinese leadership. Now this comes as quite a shock to China, the Chinese state, because just last month in October, the National Congress of the Communist Party was held, the 20th National Congress took place and Xi Jinping emerged as the president of China again, as the leader of the Communist Party again. Xi Jinping has taken over for a third term, a record third term, and he is consolidating his power and his position in China. So at this crucial time, when there has just been a transition of power, China has been hit by this internal crisis, and that adds more significance to these developments. But if you look at the arguments being made in Western media, in global media and from Western governments, it appears that there is more to these protests. These protests are not just happening because of the zero COVID policy. Yes, that is the primary reason. There is an immediate trigger. But experts, analysts are pointing out that there are other reasons as well which could be contributing to these organic protests. In general, the Chinese people, especially the younger generations, they might be looking to push for political reforms. This is one of the arguments being brought up in Western media, in Western think tanks, etc. It's also being argued that China deliberately imposed strict lockdowns in Xinjiang in particular to target the Uyghurs and to keep the rest of province under control. China might have deliberately placed Xinjiang under three months of lockdown, very strict lockdown of 100 plus days to serve a political purpose, to send out a message to Uyghurs to stop protesting, to stop rebelling against the Chinese state. There are also indications that these anti-lockdown 
sentiments, the anti-zero COVID sentiments. They have built up not just in Xinjiang but across the country and this poses a very serious challenge to President Xi Jinping and his party. Because Xi Jinping has personally promoted the zero COVID policy or the twingling policy as it is known in, known in Mandarin. Xi Jinping has said that zero COVID policy is essential to protect lives, to protect the healthcare system and to contain the, the outfall of, of this pandemic. But it's very clear that these protests, they have not happened overnight. It's not just a spontaneous uh, outsurge which has happened, but it is something which has built up over the months. And that explains why several students, even at prestigious universities like the Tsinghua University, to which the president himself belongs to, even at such prestigious universities, students have called for Xi Jinping to step down. They have protested, raised slogans against the Communist Party itself, calling for freedom to China. Now, th these developments are quite unprecedented and in the last three decades, China has never witnessed anything of this sort. So, this takes us back to the history of China. It becomes important to understand, have there been any other protests in China? In a communist authoritarian country, is it possible to witness such protests? And if such protests do happen, what are the consequences? If you look at the immediate past, if you just look at the last few weeks and few months, you will notice that there are several divides opening up in the Chinese society. Just a few days back, there were major labor protests at the Foxconn factory in China where Apple iPhones are produced. I am sure many of you would have read about this. The workers, they protested and it even turned into violence as they were complaining about the extremely poor and exploitative labor conditions, the pay structure, the exploitative work hours, etc. This again reflects the authoritarian policies of China to achieve economic growth at any cost. There were massive violent protests at the Foxconn factory which has even led Apple to shut down this manufacturing facility. Just a couple of months before this, in September, there was a bus accident. This bus was carrying those who had been quarantined under China's zero COVID policy. Those who were being taken to a quarantine facility, they were being transported in a bus and this bus met with a fatal accident and 27 people were killed, which also triggered protests against the zero COVID policy. So many experts are of the opinion that this indicates a wider discontent a wider displeasure against the political policies of the PRC. This could be seen as a political dissent, not just against the zero COVID policy, but over the entire manner in which China has been handling the pandemic, the economy and the basic rights of its people. It points towards the failure of its economic and social policies. This is what Western experts are indicating. Now, if you look at China's response to these protests, usually an authoritarian state uses brute force to curb any protest. It immediately targets any dissent with violence. But in this context, China has been little cautious. China knows the consequences of using heavy force and, in, and hence it has deployed the police forces, but it has just tried to curb the protest without resorting to mass violence, without using brute force against the protesters because China knows that if there are large scale if there are large scale violent events reported it could be exploited by the western countries who would target China with allegations of human rights violations it could lead to more internal divide in the Chinese society so China has been a little cautious and has used limited force it has deployed the police forces heavily to curb the protests and it has deployed its surveillance machinery. The notorious surveillance state of China is at work. The big brother of China is at work using advanced technologies like facial recognition, online surveillance to enforce the censorship and to keep the media silent as much as possible about these protests. So this is a feature of any authoritarian state and China is not new to this. In the past as well, whenever protests have happened, whenever there has been dissent, the media has been silenced by the Chinese state. The security agencies enforce a very strict online censorship, filtering out all the 
keywords which indicate any resentment against the state and the leadership. Of late, China is deploying advanced tools such as facial recognition tools, artificial intelligence tools to identify protesters and arrest them so that it can curb the protests without resorting to brutal violence, without leading to mass killings. So as a result of the Chinese response, the measured response, the protests have been dying out in the last couple of days. But there is every possibility of the protests reviving because the resentment is still there, according to several experts. Because this resentment is not just against one event or one incident. Experts are arguing that this is a wider resentment against the policies, the economic, social, political policies of the Communist Party. So if there are any adverse events happening in the coming days, you might very well witness a revival of some of these protests because the momentum might get carried forward. And if China is pushed on the back foot, then the Chinese state is likely to use violence leading to large scale killings as well because this has happened in the past. That is why it's very important to examine the history of protests in China. I will briefly take you through the history of communist China and specifically focus on certain events to show what kind of an authoritarian state is China. See, the Communist Party of China was established back in 1921. It's almost been 101, 102 years since the Communist Party was formed. In 1930s, 1940s, the Communist Party led a revolution. It led a communist revolution during the Chinese Civil War and it overthrew the then Republic of China. Back in 1930s, 1940s, mainland China was ruled by the Republic of China. The Republic of China was overthrown by the, by the Communist Party under the leadership of Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong laid the foundation of Maoism, which is a type of left-wing extremism. He called for the overthrow of the state. He united the lower classes, the weaker sections, the peasants, the farmers, the workers, etc. He united them to fight against a corrupt elitist government which had ignored development at the grassroots. So exploiting the economic social situation under the Republic of China, the Communist Party rose to power and Mao Zedong led the party to victory in this civil war and the Republic of China was thrown out. Now Repu Republic of China was cornered to a small island that is Taiwan, which is the source of the conflict between China and Taiwan today. The Republic of China, which was cornered to Taiwan, still claims to be the legitimate representative of the whole Chinese state. But PRC, which was established in 1949 under the communist rule, under Mao Zedong, claims complete sovereignty over Taiwan. So this is what leads to the China-Taiwan conflict today. China and most countries do not recognize the sovereignty of Taiwan. Taiwan is seen as part of the PRC sovereignty itself. As Mao Zedong rose to power and led the Communist Party to victory, he immediately came out with several radical extremist policies which were inspired by extreme forms of communism. Under his leadership, China would adopt the socialist model of economy and to establish China as a strong state, Mao Zedong would start displaying aggression in China's foreign policy, particularly towards the neighboring regions. In 1950, within few months of the PRC being established, China forcefully annexed Tibet, which until then was an independent kingdom. Tibet was annexed by China and following this annexation, the 17-point agreement was signed between PRC and the Dalai Lama through which Tibet agreed to merge with China. The Dalai Lama ratified the 17-point agreement, thus completing the formal annexation of Tibet. And hence, Tibet formally became a part of the PRC. But the Tibetans, the Tibetan Buddhists, they rejected this annexation and merger of Tibet. Discontent, the discontent Tibetans, they kept protesting against the Chinese occupation and it eventually led to a major rebellion in 1959. A Tibetan revolt broke out in 1959 and China used maximum force, military and police force, to crush the rebellion and to wipe out the Tibetan protesters.
this event led to a refugee crisis as the Dalai Lama, the religious and political figurehead of the Tibetan Buddhists, had to flee Tibet along with his followers and they eventually sought refuge in India. So this is one event to highlight how the Communist Party reacts to such protests, acts of rebellions and unrest. China used maximum force to cut down the protests, even triggering a massive refugee crisis as thousands of Tibetans under the Dalai Lama fled China, fled Tibet and sought refuge in India. Another such event happened in 1986. Much later in 1986, there was a student-led demonstration that took place protesting against the lack of freedom, the lack of political reforms in the country. This was primarily led by the students because the younger generation in the 1980s, they had been exposed to the western world, they had studied in western countries, western universities, they had seen western political systems, they had understood the concepts of freedom, liberty etc. So many of these students under the leadership of few intellectuals, they protested against the lack of political reforms even as China was witnessing an economic boom. Because by 1978, China had introduced economic reforms. China was now emerging as a major economy growing at a very rapid pace. So these students and intellectuals, they started protesting, pushing for political reforms because there was massive corruption in the country. Under communist authoritarian state, corruption had been bred within the party and the government. The youth were finding it difficult to get jobs, to find employment, despite the economic boom being witnessed in the country. The benefits of the economic growth was being cornered by few elites. There was crony capitalism in China. And it's quite ironic that a communist socialist state would adopt market-oriented policies and capitalist policies to power its economic growth in 1980s, 1990s. So students led these demonstrations, but China was quite cautious here. It did not use brutal force against the protesters. Instead, it tried to engage with them, negotiate with them. But before the protest could proceed any further, the protests fell apart. And without achieving any of the stated goals, the demonstrations quickly came to an end. Because again, China was very, very concerned about its image, its global image in particular. As China was emerging as a major economy, witnessing rapid growth, it didn't want to spoil its image and didn't use massive force. Instead, cautiously brought down the protests. But the most important event that we need to be aware of is the Tiananmen Square protests of 1989. The protests that happened at the landmark site, the Tiananmen Square, and the massacre that was carried out by the PRC over here is something that is remembered even today. And it is seen as a reflection of China's authoritarianism. To understand the Tiananmen Square protests, which is of great importance, you need to go back in history and understand the various policies of Chinese leaders. Mao Zedong, who came to power in 1949, remained in power till 1976. After displaying aggression in Tibet, Xinjiang and other parts of China, would push the country to adopt a policy called the Great Leap Forward. This was in 1958. The Great Leap Forward was an attempt by the Communist Party to reorganize the Chinese economy. As the Chinese economy was struggling in agriculture, in industrial growth, Mao Zedong promoted this policy to reorganize its population, which was mainly concentrated in the rural belt, and promoted mass migration of rural workers towards urban areas. In the urban centers, large-scale factories were set up. This was a precursor to the special economic zone concept that would be pioneered by China later, in the later decades. In the rural areas, it would promote large farming, large-scale farming. So to push China away from its agrarian economy and agrarian lifestyle, the Communist Party reorganized the population itself. It was a forceful reorganization and its population was pushed towards different sectors of the economy against their will. 
some people were pushed to take up agriculture some were pushed into different industrial sectors so this policy backfired and it had huge repercussions for the chinese people and the chinese state the policy largely failed due to the agricultural backwardness in china back then in 1960s there were complications in the in the industry and in urbanization as well so china did not achieve its objectives under the great leap forward initiative but the mass migration caused immense human suffering the large scale migration led to a famine <coughs> and between 1959 1961 millions of people lost their lives in communist china it was a direct result of the forced migration pushed by mao zedong through the great leap forward so this crisis that had happened by 1961 and early 1960s it had affected the image of mao zedong the image of the party leader had been compromised now to rebuild his image mao zedong would launch a second policy an equally disastrous policy called the cultural revolution which was launched in 1966 this was heavily based on propaganda usually in any authoritarian state propaganda is used as an effective machinery to build the image of the state and its leaders to create the image of a strong leader a strong nation and a strong party so mao zedong called upon the youth the chinese youth the next generation of the chinese to undertake a socio political revolution he called upon the youth to push the chinese society away from its traditional mindset mao zedong felt that great leap forward had failed because of the traditional backward thinking of chinese he asked the chinese youth to fight against the four olds the so called four olds or the perceived enemies of chinese culture which is the traditional customs the old habits the traditional culture and traditional thinking of the previous generation of the chinese mao zedong he blamed the four olds of the chinese society for the failure of the great leap forward he called upon the next generation the youth to take it upon themselves to eradicate the traditional mindset of the chinese society to find new customs to come out with a new thinking a more aggressive thinking to give up traditional outdated culture and habits so many youth who were brainwashed with this propaganda they took matters into their own hands they would target anyone who was opposed to this idea anybody who wouldn't fit this mindset who would oppose the idea of a cultural revolution would be targeted they would be beaten up arrested executed and killed as well so this essentially brought anarchy to china and with anarchy the chinese state became even more stronger as people were fighting against each other especially the radicalized youth were targeting others the state concentrated all the powers and the military its intelligence agencies along with the communist party they centralized even more authority and china became a complete authoritarian communist state it was almost like a stalinist purge just like joseph stalin had purged any rebellion in soviet union similarly under mao zedong during the cultural revolution there was a complete purge of opposition and dissent this again was a period of anarchy but the chinese state became stronger and more centralized along with greater powers being devolved to the military the police and the intelligence agencies so effectively china became a police state a surveillance state where the censors would cut off everything any anything against the state and the leaders would be erased and and it would be wiped off so all rights all freedoms were essentially curbed and this laid the ground for the next evolution in the chinese polity and chinese economy now in 1976 mao zedong passed away there was another leader who who took power for 2 years he was widely liked by the youth by the students especially the progressives the progressive youth who were against mao zedong and such radical ideas they liked this new leader but very quickly he was removed as well from power then came deng xiaoping whom you can see in this image here this image is of great importance it depicts the five strong leaders of china you can see mao zedong here deng xiaoping here this is 
Zhang Zemin, who passed away just two days back. If you have read current affairs, you would be aware of this. Just two days back, former Chinese President Zhang Zemin has passed away. Even India has condoled his death. This is Hu Jintao and this is the current President Xi Jinping. So after Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping is credited with introducing large-scale economic reforms which pushed China to become a great economic power. It was under Deng Xiaoping that the Tiananmen Square massacre took place in 1989. After Deng Xiaoping, it was Jiang Zemin who led China towards economic prosperity and turned China into a very successful political military state. Then it was Hu Jintao who pushed China ahead of most other Asian countries and pushed China to compete with Western countries including the US itself. And then came Xi Jinping who has consolidated power since 2012 and recently has taken control of the Communist Party again for the third term and has become the president for the third time. So following the death of Mao Zedong, the country which was in a state of anarchy was witnessing a dire economic situation. Its socialist model had failed. The Communist Party was, was facing a lot of opposition. Its image had been compromised. The image of its leader Mao Zedong itself had been compromised. The progressive youth were looking to new leaders like the temporary president who was there for two years between 1976 and 1978. In the midst of this crisis, Deng Xiaoping who took over in 1978 introduced major economic reforms. This is where China opened up. In 1978, China introduced a new concept of socialism, the so-called socialism with Chinese characteristics. This was basically an adoption of Western capitalism. It was an adoption of market-oriented reforms, free market reforms in a communist state. This was quite unique and ironic as well because a communist socialist state was adopting free market reforms and capitalism and it was being labeled as socialism with Chinese characteristics. But this opening up and liberalization of Chinese economy brought tremendous growth and throughout 1980s, 1990s and of course early 2000. In these three decades, China emerged as a major global power, as a top global economic power and as well as a strong military power. Parallelly, the failed policies were being removed. The collectivization of agriculture which was pushed during Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution was was being revoked. Agriculture was being modernized. China was opening up to foreign investment, to FDI. It started setting up mega factories and special economic zones and encouraged private enterprise. Until then, businesses were largely state controlled, but now private enterprise was encouraged. So this liberalization opened up a new era in China starting from 1978-1980s. It led to a major economic boom it brought a lot of prosperity and millions were lifted out of poverty. But parallelly, the Chinese people saw that the economic boom did not bring about any political changes. There were no political reforms. Even though China was growing economically, becoming one of the fastest growing nations, there was no political changes that was taking place. It was this frustration and increasing corruption within the Chinese state that led the students and the masses to protest throughout 1980s. Throughout 1980s, protests kept happening every now and then, which finally culminated with the Tiananmen Square protest in 1989. Lakhs of students, uh, they accumulated at the landmark site at the Tiananmen Square and they went on for a very long protest lasting several weeks and months. Initially, China did not use much force. It was very cautious about harming its global image. But after the protest started posing a threat to the, C to the Communist Party, it imposed martial law. It imposed martial law and did not hesitate to use massive force, brutal violent force against the protesters. This image that you are seeing here, it's an iconic image from these protests. The PLA, People Liberation Army, was called in to target the protesters at the Tiananmen Square as martial law had been imposed. The Chinese army brought in tanks, battle tanks, and they rolled down the streets of Tiananmen Square, and hundreds and hundreds of students and protesters were crushed by these battle tanks. 
You can see one protester here standing right in front of these tanks opposing them. And this image became an iconic symbol of the Chinese protest of 1989. Following this large scale violence, China was criticized for human rights violations, for committing human rights violations. And China has done everything internally to erase the memory of Tiananmen Square. Internally, if you look at China, if you go through any newspapers, if you read any journals, even online, if you try to find something about Tiananmen Square protests, you will not find anything about China's human rights violations. You will find that the protesters were anti-national elements. You will find that China used force to protect the state. It was Western agents, according to China, who were promoting these protesters. That is how China has labeled these events. It has erased all memory of Tiananmen Square protests. And any attempt to revive the memory is still dealt with very, very strictly in China. Just last year in Hong Kong, there was a commemorative event that was held to mark the Tiananmen Square massacre. And a top executive of a top company was arrested by China and is currently in jail because he participated in this vigil and in this commemorative event. That is how China acts against any attempt to revive the memories of this massacre. Essentially, China denies the massacre happened. It says the violence was justified because these protesters were anti-nationals who were looking to break the communist state. So this is how China has reacted in its past. And you can see the same continuing in its problematic regions and provinces. You look at Xinjiang province. As I mentioned earlier, China has apparently oppressed and targeted the Uyghur Muslim minorities. And the Uyghurs have always sought to liberate this region from China. Those who have been radicalized, those who have close links with terror outfits and radical groups in Central Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, they have set up a terror group called ETIM, East Turkestan Islamic Movement, to carry out terror attacks against China and to liberate Xinjiang to form a new country called East Turkestan. So here as well, there are frequent protests, acts of rebellions, terror attacks by ETIM. Whenever these incidents happen, China retaliates with massive force, brutal force. That is why analysts are saying China has deliberately imposed very strict lockdowns in Xinjiang to send out a political message, to teach a lesson to the Uyghurs to not rebel against China. It's in Xinjiang that Western countries have accused China of committing large-scale human rights violations. Reportedly, China has pushed many Uyghurs, even innocent civilian Uyghurs, into so-called re-education camps, which are basically large-scale detention facilities. In the name of de-radicalization and counter-terrorism, China is pushing millions of Uyghurs into these re-education camps and forcing the Uyghurs to violate their religious faith and their practices. This is being seen as a human right violation and hence China has been targeted by Western countries. You see the same happening in Tibet. Even today in Tibet, there is a low scale political movement. A few years back, there were few Tibetan Buddhist monks who would set themselves on fire and commit suicide as an act of protest against the communist state. But China has retaliated against any form of protest. It has curbed them with brutal force and oppression and by deploying the entire state surveillance machinery against protesters. Another example would be Hong Kong. Hong Kong was a British colony until recently, until 1997. It was only in 97 that British transferred Hong Kong back to China. But while making this transfer, an agreement was signed. A basic agreement was signed between Britain and China, through which China was made to commit to protect democracy in Hong Kong. Essentially, Britain agreed to give Hong Kong to Chinese sovereignty. China, that is PRC, will exercise sovereignty over Hong Kong. It belongs to Chinese territory. But as per the agreement, the basic agreement of 1997, China is expected to protect democracy in Hong Kong. Whereas mainland China remains a communist authoritarian state. This was the arrangement worked out by Britain while giving Hong Kong back to China. That is why it is said that Hong Kong represents one country, two systems. Hong Kong is part of Chinese sovereignty, 
So it's all one country, but there are two different political systems. Mainland China being a communist authoritarian state where there are no basic rights and fundamental rights, but Hong Kong being a democracy, Hong Kong and Macau, the popular resort destination, Hong Kong and Macau, these both had to be preserved and protected as democracies, open democracies with all basic rights and liberties. This arrangement continued for several years, but in the last few years, China has tried to erase democracy in Hong Kong. It introduced a extradition law. It br brought out an extradition bill in 2013 after Xi Jinping came to power, which would allow the citizens of Hong Kong to be extradited to China if they are seen to be threatening Chinese national security. So essentially, if someone in Hong Kong exercises their democratic right to criticize the state, they could be extradited to China to face punishment under Chinese laws, under communist authoritative laws. So this extradition bill became very controversial and triggered mass pro-democracy protests. But the Communist Party has built a pro-communist support base in Hong Kong and there are constant battles between the pro-communist group and the pro-democracy groups in Hong Kong. These protests have only escalated in the last few years and China even introduced a controversial law recently called the National Security Law in Hong Kong. This allows Chinese security and intelligence agencies and Chinese police to extend their jurisdiction into Hong Kong. So security agencies from mainland China will get to exercise their jurisdiction in Hong Kong as well, thereby effectively erasing democracy and the terms of the basic agreement that China had committed to with Britain. So this has led to large scale protests in Hong Kong and in 2019-2020, China dealt with these protesters with brute force and violence. It has arrested a lot of people, extradited many of them, even top executives of big companies, even the rich have not been spared, even the influential people have been arrested and China has completely curbed these protests. So this is another example to show how China reacts when there is any form of dissent or opposition within the country. So now, considering that these protests have happened, which have been largely organic, what can we expect from the Communist Party? What can one expect from Xi Jinping and what consequences does it have for India and the world? See, China is right now going through a very sensitive, delicate phase. As I mentioned, just last month in October, the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party took place and Xi Jinping has extended his term. Even a constitutional amendment was done, which would allow Xi Jinping to become the president for the third term. Because there was a restriction that an individual can become the president only for two terms, who could head the Communist Party only for two terms. This has been amended and Xi Jinping has consolidated power within the party and he has arrested all his political opponents. In the last few months before the National Congress, all his political opponents were arrested, removed and he has brought only his loyalists into the Politburo, which is the highest decision making body of the Communist Party. So Xi Jinping was hoping for a smooth transition. Xi Jinping was aware of the resentment that was building up because of the zero Covid policy. So China was looking to slowly relax the lockdown measures. But before that could happen, the fire accident took place in Urumqi in Xinjiang and it triggered massive protests across China. So this represents a very serious challenge for Xi Jinping and the Communist Party itself as its image stands affected. It's not just the Uyghurs who protested, even the majority Han community across China have protested organically. Students especially have protested across major cities and universities. So this could be of very serious concern for the Communist Party. Plus the Chinese economy is facing a lot of challenges, mainly because of the pandemic, the lockdowns, the Russia-Ukraine war, which has disrupted the global supply chains and the global recession, which everyone is predicting, the long global recession in the economy the high interest rates, lack of growth, lack of jobs, this poses a very serious threat for the survival of the Communist Party. Till date, the Communist Party has remained in power by centralizing authority. It has relied upon propaganda 
to spread a good image about the party and the leaders, to erase any negativity about the party and the leadership. If any protests or any opposition comes up, as we saw, China has used violence and oppression to curb them. Initially, it exercises a little bit of caution, considering the global image and the internal consequences. But if things get out of hand, China does not hesitate to use brutal force. It has done it repeatedly in Xinjiang, in Tibet, in Hong Kong, and even in major Chinese cities as well. So these are the major tools which are at the disposal of the Communist Party. Other than this, China has always celebrated its economic success to counter the negative image which builds up every now and then. To counter any dissent and opposition, China glorifies its economic success. So constant economic growth has helped China to keep a check on dissent and opposition. Because the growth would bring benefits and better standard of living to the Chinese people, thus keeping a check on any resentment from building up. It acts as a cushion against any social revolution. But now, the Chinese economy itself is going through a dull period. It is facing an economic crisis. Plus, the propaganda machinery may not be effective all the time. As you saw in the recent protests, despite the best efforts of state surveillance and censorship, the protests, they spread organically, the message went viral, and people organized themselves and protested against the Chinese state. So when propaganda doesn't work, when you can't use mass violence all the time against your people, and when your economy is in crisis, the only last option available to an authoritarian state is to use aggression against foreign powers and neighbors. To create an external crisis, to deliberately trigger an external crisis with a neighboring country or with a foreign power, so that you channel all the concentration and divert the public attention towards this external problem. This is where consequences lie for India and the rest of the world. As I mentioned, India shares a disputed border. China has been repeatedly aggressive and hostile to India. China has picked multiple disputes in South China Sea. It has picked maritime disputes with Vietnam, with Philippines, with Vietnam, Philippines, with Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei. It has also picked a major dispute with Japan in East China Sea. And it has never hesitated to use military aggression to threaten its neighbors when it comes to these territorial and maritime disputes. Plus, China is involved in a Cold War rivalry with the US and the Western countries. There is a great game going on between these global powers. So China wouldn't hesitate to channel all the internal problems and create a diversion by picking a new crisis with either a neighboring country or with foreign powers. So this could mean that India would do well to be prepared for any possible aggression from the Chinese state. So on this note, I would like to bring my discussion to an end. We have comprehensively discussed the unprecedented protests which happened in China, the reasons behind it. We understood the background, the history of protests in China, the history of its political social system, and the consequences or the significance of this development for India and the rest of the world. So I hope it's been a productive session. If you liked it, do press the like button, share your comments below, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching. Good night.